Alright, so we're going to start off December with three movies that have anything but uh, Holly Jolly subject matter. So, uh, and one shitty animated movie. So there's that also. But uh, let's start with Marriage Story. Noah Baumbach's new movie that's obviously got an overwhelming amount of uh, award buzz and Oscar buzz specifically. And yeah, as far as Baumbach goes... He every now and then he makes a movie that's the total bane of my existence, like Francis Hall. But for the most part, he makes stuff that's just really so almost indescribably powerful in the way he's able to find the reality in all these uh, relatable situations, particularly within family. Like one one of it, one of my favorite movies is probably uh, The Squid and the Whale. It obviously didn't make that video we did, but. It would be very close, uh, and still to this, I, I actually just rewatched The Squid and the Whale relatively recently, and it's still just as powerful to me as it ever was. And he's also got a lot of sort of off the radar stuff, like he he's got movies that people know about, but then there's stuff like Highball and Mr. Jealousy and Kicking and Screaming that you don't really hear about enough. But he's got a really damn strong and consistent filmography. But um, this one kind of is easily, you can see why it's going to be considered one of his upper tier stuff, especially with so many personal places he's already come from with his previous movies. This one is apparently, uh, comes from his marriage to Jennifer Jason Leigh and ultimately their divorce also. And apparently Jennifer Jason Leigh has seen the movie and is, approves of it, I guess you could say. And yeah, immediately when it starts, it puts you right in that kind of heartbreaking position, like just the opening itself, with we're each we're seeing it each from the perspective of the husband and wife being Adam Driver and Scarlett Johansson, and they're going through this mediation where they talk. The exercise seems to be this is just the way it's introduced to us without any of the we're not quite sure what we're looking at until we reach the the end of it of uh, this scene, which is. They're each describing like you would when you're like falling in love for the first time or you've just fallen in love with somebody and it's all those little tiny details and things that they do that you recognize and it's just, it, it, all of that just builds into one giant emotion for this person and it's, it seems like this really loving sort of thing and then it just drops on us that the setting that this is in like a mediation thing and they are currently going through a divorce and it's just kind of this immediate gut punch in the very first moment just right away and that's when you realize how likely unrelenting this movie's probably going to be emotionally so um and then there's and there's even moments that you may recognize like there is um one shot on a tennis court of adam driver that feels very much like uh bernard the jeff daniels character in the squid and the whale and, but yeah, it also, like, he, he, his movies never, despite tackling seemingly similar material and emotions, his movies have never felt repetitive, which is kind of amazing, especially with how many he has up to this point now. And I think another thing that really makes it work was something I was reading about where he had had um, Adam Driver, Scarlett Johansson, and Laura Dern in mind for their roles, so much so that they pretty much began before he'd even finished writing it. So it was kind of able to, um, so, I guess sort of in the way Ethan Hawke and Julie Delpy would um, collaborate with Richard Linklater on the Before trilogy, where they kind of got they got that input and they kind of all got to write their characters as they went along. And that kind of gives it this really improvised feel throughout. But apparently, like, everything down to the last minute detail is scripted. But it's I, it's I think it's that collaborative process that is able to make everything feel so real and almost, almost like it's in the moment, almost like they just the actors just had a camera put on them and then were just told to do whatever. Um, but it, apparently it is all just very specifically scripted, which is amazing. And you also get um, a lot of those long takes, not not like the really you know showy ones or the tracking shots or anything like that. But just these really simple ones, oftentimes just lingering on the character's face. And there are those long takes in those scenes that go on for so long to the point that you don't realize how long they've gone on until after the scene is over. 
and there is a there is a lot of that. It is like the the runtime almost looks a bit overbearing at like two hours and sixteen minutes. I think it is for a story like this, but uh, you really don't feel that much at all. And I, uh, those sort of long scenes, I think, have a lot to do with that. Especially the more sort of like some of them are downplayed, some of them are not at all. So. And there's, every now and then there's also, like, when you, when you think of pacing, you also think of, like, editing, but that's not really, it's one of those, it's not, like, showy editing, but there are things, and things that they do and choices that they make that are noticeable, um, that have nothing to do with, like, necessarily pacing or anything like that, but, like, this moment that, where they, it's almost like Driver hardly has to act in the scene because the editing does the work for him. And it's when they've just had this talk, and they're and obviously in this situation, one or both of them at some point may have that feeling deep inside them of, is there hope? Maybe. So it's this shot of Driver getting ready to walk out the door, and she calls his name, and when he turns around to respond, it suddenly cuts to like a much more close-up uh, shot of him. Where it's like, you can see, just in that alone, without him having to really even do anything, that moment of hope. Like, is she saying, is she going to say, maybe we can work this out, but it ends up just being something mundane before he leaves. Um, and it's stuff like that, as small as it is. Like, it, it sounds showy the way I describe it, but it's really not at all. So, even little things like that really work so much. And... Yeah, and you you look at this, and there is there is a sort of comedic nature to it, but at the same time, he, there's going to be... Because the child is between them also, and this is kind of a driving force and where a lot of their conflicts with each other come from, yeah, there's going to be inevitable comparisons to Kramer vs. Kramer, which is really funny, since I did a uh, versus video on Kramer vs. Kramer with the squid and the whale. So, it's like, it was it was inevitable he eventually got to that sort of territory again. But like I said, still doesn't, there's no redundancy in his filmography, even if the subject matter feels similar. Um, he has so many different ways of portraying just these real, these seemingly real moments like I said, but also that sort of sense of humor about them, particularly in a right way, especially, which is why I think the casting of Adam Driver in particular is so perfect, because he can do lines like, uh, when he, the, he's trying to get the kid into the car, and we see this rare moment, uh, for a long time, his moments of frustration seem rare, where, the, where he's, like, really, really visibly frustrated, and so he says, um, get in the fucking car, and then that immediately, uh, is toned down to, I'm sorry, but get in the fucking car. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the same line, but just so much calmer. And it's like, I, it's hard to imagine um, an actor other than the type like Adam Driver to be able to get away with a, a line like that and actually have the sort of humor come out without the character seeming too off-putting at the same time. Because, yeah, in a story like this, you're eventually going to get to points to where either character is going to seem like like, how did the other ever put up with this person, or how did they ever do this? But we also obviously see those moments of the characters realizing this themselves. But in this way that, like, none of the characters are... The characters being the two of them specifically. Y you are just going to eventually get to those moments where one of them may be off-putting. But it's, like I said, in, in this really human sort of way, uh, to where it's like... W well, there was there was no way this character didn't have this in them. Otherwise, they would be really too much like a movie character. Uh, and so the the way they were able to bring they weren't afraid to bring that stuff out in their characters. Like they weren't afraid of the characters seeming off putting. Um, and I think it's the fact that you know there's no particular side to take probably has a lot to do with how successful that is. And so that's and you and you get these moments like where there, there almost seems to be a somewhat of a contrast in the driver character but the, they find just enough of a balance to where I said it just makes him seem more human like there are moments where he might seem a bit neurotic in certain ways but then there's other times where he's almost too comfortable in a situation that should be uncomfortable like when they're all getting this at lunch in this sort of like work like setting uh, where it's just a rapid just take a look at the menu and order something and while everybody else has done this he's just 
taking his sweet ass time just looking the whole thing over um and not and not to be that way but just that's just his character uh he just wants to know what the hell's on that menu uh and it's just real moments like that that really stand out where you don't even necessarily need dialogue uh, which is actually the case for a lot of them so and then then there's even stuff that might seem like in an in some other indie movie or something it might seem like too much of a way to make like it you can where those movies where you can they're trying too hard to be authentic and you can really see the wheels turning and there's a moment when they're in court and one of the guys just sneezes and there's no apart from driver saying bless you there's no there's no reason it's there and there's no attention drawn to it it's just a moment that happens because that's that's just what happens and it's like in another movie, uh, you could almost see it as one of those things where you could see it trying to be authentic, but still, Baumbach has this perfect way of just making everything seem natural, no matter what it is, no matter how big or small it is. Because you can talk about the small moments in this, you know, for for days probably, but it's all, it eventually will reach the really really big moments. Also, one scene in particular that. I can only imagine will be the most talked about scene in the movie where we we will with all these tensions going on and the back and forth between the two of them we're reaching some sort of breaking point that we know is eventually going to come uh and it does uh in a very very big way and where it's like this it's almost like just this normal sparring between them of words that just builds into something more and more vicious as the scene goes on I think I was also reading where Bob would give them specific notes, where they, they shot, every time they would do this scene, it was all in one shot. Like, it's not cut that way in the movie, but it's, when they shot it, that's just how, they just did it all at once, and then would go back and do it again if need be. And apparently he would give them certain notes that they wouldn't tell the others, so that there were some surprises in this fight where you can see genuinely they kind of throw each other off with how they react in certain ways, whether it's going to be downplayed, or really big, and that's and all of that comes through. Like I said, e even knowing the mechanics of the scene when you read about that stuff, it still just comes through in such a real sort of way. Um, and there's even uh, moments with Dreyer's performance where there's there's a particular scene towards the end of physicality, and there's this might sound weird out of context about saying like what the scene is, but it's like. It's a scene that involves no dialogue, and it's just Driver do it, like the physicality of his performance, and the scene is like nausea-inducing, but in like the most effective way, and <laughs> it's and yeah, the way you, you he can reach all these different sort of moods, um, whether it be our hearts break for them, or we're scared what one of them is going to do or say to the other. Or the moments where it's these sort of unexpected comedic moments, or anything like that, and it does find this really nice balance. And it's, I, I guess, if there's really the problem would just be if you if you don't necessarily care for those movies, like like the way I say, this movie avoids doing the whole. You can see the mechanics of it and them doing these specific things because they seem real. I can imagine that not working uh, for people. It's certainly not worked for a lot of otherwise talented filmmakers before. Um, but it's if that works for you in this movie, the scenes like that, then I, I imagine the whole thing probably will. And like I said, the performances themselves are just undeniably natural and also come from... We, I mean, we talked about uh, the two of them, and there's, there's Laura Dern, who's basically just pretty much her character, Renata and Big Little Lies. Like, there's really, as far as I remember, not really much of a departure from that here, uh, which pretty much just speaks for itself, because that's obviously a character she's perfected, so that goes in all of its directions. And she's obviously got a lot of buzz also, so there's that. And then you've got, like, Ray Liotta and Alan Alda as his alternating lawyers uh, that also are really strong, even, even though they're not even there that often. Uh, Mara Weaver, just, people just kind of come in and out of the movie and just do really strong stuff without having to necessarily show off. Julie Haggerty is especially great as, uh, Johansson's mom, so, yeah, all that, uh, works really well, and I can see, I mean, it's, 
I don't know that I love it as much as uh, the rest of the awards contenders we've seen so far this year, um, but it's obviously very strong and kind of in that upper tier of... Uh, well, like, like, some people might immediately jump on, this is the best thing Bombbox done, but the Squid and the Whale is a really high bar uh, for me personally, So, um, but it's definitely worthy of his filmography and just the continuous uh, strength throughout it. It's it it'll be really interesting to go back and watch Margaret at the wedding now, especially knowing the Jennifer Jason Lee connection. And I actually wanted to revisit Margaret at the wedding before I saw this again, but I I didn't think to, the the years going by too fast, so I didn't I wasn't able to. But um, I do definitely want to do that and re kind of revisit a lot of his other movies now that we're talking about them again, especially those uh, lesser known ones, lesser known ones with Eric Stoltz um, are all really great also. So yeah, there's that. Um, so uh, let's go on to Dark Waters, and Dark Waters and the Report are going to kind of, as you can probably guess by the subject matter, uh, kind of, my opinion of them is going to kind of bleed it, they're going to kind of bleed into each other a lot, because um, they all kind of come from that, they both kind of come from that same place of, uh, they're going to leave audiences so frustrated and potentially infuriated in that way that uh, recent movies like Spotlight and The Big Short have shown where it's um, all this stuff that's being like, you know, covered up or ignored and regardless of the bad things that happen to people and the innocent people that just, if they're not deteriorating, they reach death and it's just ignored by these really greedy people who want to put everything under the rug and just be the giant corporate shit that they are. So th as far as Dark Waters goes, though, um, you may have to forgive if this... Uh, this isn't like an all-out, uh, straightforward, like, review of sorts, because, um, it's kind of, uh, there's kind of a whole unique perspective as far as Dark Waters goes, um, in the way that I view it, because obviously it is set in, uh, West Virginia, uh, where I have lived forever, and the, the thing about that, though, <laughs> is that pretty, this is, this area more or less is so sort of untouched movie wise and when it is more often than not it's in an unflattering way um not that this isn't <laughs> but um in the way that any time a movie so much as references west virginia or any part of it it's the people around here just kind of freak out like it's oh my god people know we exist if they just reference any part of the state whatsoever but the thing that really makes this um, unique as far as the way I was looking at it was it is right down to the city. <laughs> the city that I have lived in my entire life is the focal point of the movie. And this, and to give an example, this is a movie that we would never in a million years get at our theater in this town. But when I went to see it today, it was in the second biggest auditorium, and it was full. <laughs> so, and otherwise, we, we, I don't think we have ever had a Todd Haynes movie in this town at all. And I don't think we ever will after this either. <laughs> this is a very uh, unique thing about that. And it was so surreal to see uh, Ruffalo was on Stephen Colbert promoting the movie, and just hearing him say that <laughs> the city on a major talk show was just so bizarre to me <laughs> um it's just it's just really not common at all we get briefly name dropped in a johnny cash song and that's about it <laughs> um and it's people can and the thing about it also is that it was kind of distracting was it wasn't shot here um so it's it's, it's one of those cases where it, when i hear about people saying like that can, tends to distract them when things are shot in their area or whatever and they see the differences or what they're sort of hiding um, I kind of, kind of just dismiss it as, well, you know, that's not very open-minded. But no, it's like, every time there was an exterior shot, it was like, I could see they were just enough, like, there's, there's a banner with the name of the high school that I went to, I think signifying that that location is supposed to be the high school, but it obviously looks nothing like that area whatsoever, and it's in a montage as Ruffalo is driving through town, and there's something that looks like City Park, briefly but like i said just enough to where the camera doesn't show the place but just enough to where it's like i think that's what they want that to represent um so stuff like that was kind of taking over my mind also um 
I mean, not to mention this also puts um, even more of a punch in regards to the terrifying subject matter. Um, so there's that way that I view the movie in a different way also than I would another movie like this, like like The Insider or something like that. It's kind of in that same vein. Uh, you can also tell it wasn't shot around here because if it was, there's a likely chance we all would have known because when Soderbergh was here shooting Bubble, it was like all people talked about for like months. Uh, like that's how generally uneventful it is as far as um, movies go in this area. But uh, yeah, as far as, you know, the subject matter itself, um, I said I would only hear about it like periodically from time to time and then it would like sort of disappear and then resurface. Um, and I don't, I don't know that that's, like, that could just be the circles that I was in, and it could have been, you know, a bigger deal, in, bigger deal in other areas, but I was also, I would have been, like, what, seven or eight at the time it, like, started, um, in the, in the storyline where, um, the Bill Camp character, the farmer, uh, goes to Ruffalo in Cincinnati to tell him about what's going on and get him to do this, which, of course, Ruffalo is connected to this, having spent time in this area in his youth, uh, and that's pretty much his, you know, familial connection to uh, Bill Camp and how this, he eventually gets invested in this to the point that it, it sort of starts to mirror the life of his, uh, his character in Zodiac, where it just has to, there's no choice but it has to consume his life regardless of what that, what that does to him, um, both personally and, you know, at home and all that with his wife, uh, Anne Hathaway, and... Yeah, and the way he just has to keep going up against this, regardless of how futile it is. There's even the moment where the guy walks in, and the woman's like, uh, so you're gonna sue DuPont? And, and then she just kind of nonchalantly says, well, good luck with that. Uh, and yeah, that's pretty much uh, the vibe of going up against this. Like I said, we'll talk about this a lot with the report also, where it's the whole going up against the seemingly undefeatable undefeatable enemy but it's like the worst thing you can say in a situation like this is what's the point because uh, you like regardless of it being you know the right thing to do and the fact that you know people are getting sick and dying even if nothing comes of it it's like you have to be driven to do something even the slightest thing and if you can get even just a little bit of progress that's better than none uh, and giving up so yeah, and then that's kind of that's kind of the common theme between both of these movies, uh, this and the report. Um, and I think Ruffalo is probably a perfect casting choice. I'm not entirely familiar um, with the real dude, but it's the way Ruffalo plays. This might seem like the way he plays many characters. Like I said, particularly his Zodiac character, but in that way that he he's believable as somebody this also goes into his spotlight character also where he believably plays somebody that would do his very best and give everything to go up against um this thing but he's also very he's very meek by comparison and you can really feel the weight of just how heavy everything is and how big everything is that's against them um, but he believably just, like, constantly fights back regardless of what that takes. And the way he's been able to use, use that through other characters uh, makes him fit this one just as well as those. I suppose you can make the obvious joke that this movie is Ruffalo taking his revenge against DuPont after the events of Foxcatcher. Um, but, you know, the obvious joke is obvious. <laughs> um, and then there are these moments particularly with uh, Victor Garber. Um, that's, that's another thing about this, is it's like when you hear of movies taking place here, you imagine they're, usually they're just movies that local people make that are like a below straight to video, um, but to see the names involved in this also is still just, the whole movie just kind of felt surreal at the same time, and I was trying to kind of separate from that, um, and see it as some, like how I would see any other movie like I was talking about before. Um, but these scenes, anyway, with Victor Garber, um, where he he's the guy that he he's also kind of a perfect casting choice where he seems like really personable and approachable uh, in that regular sort of that charming Victor Garber way, but then when, in these moments where we kind of get to see who he really is, in in particular this moment when they're at like this formal dinner, and when Ruffalo is kind of starting to turn it around on him and tell him what the issues are. And Victor Garber goes from personable and approachable to screaming 
screaming fuck you in his face in front of everybody at this formal dinner to get him to go away and cover this up. And you get scenes later that really show the reality of this because there there were obviously a lot of movies like this, particularly like, you know, in the older days of Hollywood where the whole idea was making everything just that, Hollywoodized. But now you were in this phase where we can get movies like that. There's still movies like that that way sort of, you know, overgloss everything. But then, but there's really a trend in movies like this lately where we get moments when he's talking straight to Victor Garber in a boardroom and telling him about the C8. And it's like, these are the effects and this is how it's evolved and all that. And... Victor Garber is just a, a fucking stone wall that is just not moving at all. Like, in, in in some, you know, glossy movie, this would be the moment where, like, Victor Garber would hang his head in shame and realize the depth of what he's done and the damage that it's doing. Um, but it's, you're just kind of slapped in the face with reality, and it's like, it's like just talking to the abyss, and there's just nothing there, there is no reaction, there is nothing done about it, and nobody seems to fucking care. <laughs> <laughs> and that and that scene alone kind of perfectly encapsulates that whole feeling. Um, so there's that, and then you also kind of get the the sort of dead end with other people, like the oblivious people. Like there is um, the moment when everybody's getting like their blood tested, and he uh, one of them approaches this woman, and this woman just has a happy look on her face. And she's like, you can go ahead and do this, but you're not going to find anything because this is all bullshit and DuPont is good people. And it's and just those moments are like so... There, There's definitely a certain helplessness there, um, which is why it's it's it feels better to have characters like the, like the guy Ruffalo is playing that'll just keep going regardless of this and doesn't let stuff like this just just stop him, just make him give up, when, like I said, it seems like, and, and, like, the further it goes on, the more helpless it should seem, and the more, like, there's, there's just no end to this, and there's no happy ending to this at all, um, so, that, so, in a way, it's, like, it, it makes it sound like there's no sort of, like, it, it would almost be, counterproductive to do a movie like this and show the reality of it and not at least have a hint of optimism um like to just say this is what it is and you know it fucking sucks the end um and it's like the way they're able to inject that optimism into it to where you you still leave it like emotionally drained especially when you're in the fucking area <laughs> um but it's still uh, there's there's still that quality to it to where they they can put in that optimism without it seeming like they're n they're, they're not necessarily giving us you know a happy ending but they're not giving us the fuck it all ending either so it's yeah they find that tonally just enough to where it's not just you know resigning itself which they could which they could have done and I guess they could have been because that's where the fine line is between uh like being a realist and just being a cynic and it's it's a really kind of blurred line there where <laughs> where there's definitely crossing over but it's yeah um but as far as you know the rest of the movie goes as a movie like I said if I was looking if I was watching it as somebody on the outside of this area entirely it it does sort of seem like it's going for that you know kind of china syndrome 70s sort of vibe and it's, but like I said, it's also that matter-of-fact way that it presents itself that that suits the material and takes the material as seriously as it needs to be taken. Um, but it does, it, it trying to kind of go for that sort of vibe of those other movies, like, you know, The China Syndrome or The Parallax View or The Insider or something like that. Um, All the President's Men, even to an extent, more so with the report with that. Um... It's I it doesn't quite reach that. Like if I was watching this on the outside without this taking place in an area that I know, um, I would probably it would probably be much more just like any other one of those movies with nothing to really differentiate it. Um, and those moments where like you you can watch a movie and say like, oh you know that's a really 
you know, horrible situation, I'd li and I'd like to know no more about that real situation, but the movie itself didn't really do much to convey that, apart from just, you know, basically being a filmed Wikipedia, Wikipedia synopsis. Um, but, yeah, there is a certain feel that Haynes finds here, and despite the fact that I don't recall him making a movie like this with this sort of subject matter, um, the closest obviously being safe, um, but when, when you think of him, you tend to think of his more Douglas Sorka-esque stuff, like Carol and uh, Far From Heaven and stuff like that. Um, but I do think there there's definitely something about his style that can suit this material, um, to where it doesn't feel... Like I, can, like, I say that he didn't quite reach the stuff like those 70s movies, but it's there to an extent, for sure, that feel. Um, so... Yeah, just the feel of it in general. Like I was saying, the the cast is really great. Tim Robbins, especially, uh, has some really good scenes here. Particularly, like, his whole blow-up scene um, is just perfect without being too overblown or being too overdramatic and movie-like. Um, every Like, all this stuff and the emotion feels real at its core, so there's that. And there's also the nice touch of having some people either play themselves or people that were kind of involved with it in one way or another as like sort of background characters that are revealed to us in the uh, closing credits before the actual credit roll. Um, if, it, if anybody's kind of thrown away here, I guess it would be Hathaway, who just kind of gets the thankless sort of wife role. And there's one scene towards the end where you can see her trying to break out of that, but they never really gave her much of a chance to, but... Yeah, but with, with the center of it being um, Ruffalo's character and his dilemma and how he's, you know fighting this it's it, it yeah it's like t too much uh deviating of attention would have yeah the movie has a certain focus that it really didn't need to necessarily lose so that's that's up for debate but other than that uh yeah so um like i said it's it's really hard to see for me to see this movie in any other light um but that's pretty much um the best i can do with that so um th like i said that just kind of goes further into the, into the report, um, where it's this whole, once again, just the importance of seeking justice, regardless of it seeming like, you know, a totally, completely losing battle. Um, I said that just, just how dangerous it is to go up against this stuff and just say, what's even the point? Like, why bother? Um, and you get that vibe a lot, like, going against that and being... And fighting through that when you look at characters like uh, Adam Driver's character in this, um, and it's we're we're going we're going into the whole uh, the to the torturing people after 9/11 to get information that supposedly led to the killing of Osama bin Laden, but obviously not quite the case to the point that this movie actually calls out Zero Dark Thirty specifically uh, for pretty much being a propaganda movie uh, and putting out uh, a lot of false information regarding the connection between the two, which there is not really much of at all. <laughs> um, so, and much like Dark Waters, um, there's nothing really flashy about it. It takes the more like, 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 obviously in the 70s, your kind of go-to comparison movie would be All the President's Men. Um, but lately that's been, like, you'd almost say it's the Spotlight way of doing things now, where Spotlight wasn't, you know, flashing about itself and was very matter-of-fact about it. Um, and like I said, just sort of added to the seriousness of the subject without it, like... The great thing about movies like Spotlight and uh, Dark Waters and The Report being so straightforward and not particularly flashy. Like, I, I could see somebody watching this and wanting something uh, more along the lines of, like, The Big Short, um, or, like, for maybe, like, a lighter approach to the really grim subject matter, or something just all-out grim, like the way Fincher, uh, with, you know, approach material like this, like, we were just talking about Zodiac and, you know, the way the social networks cut together and all that. Um, but I think, what, and, it's, and what I'm about to say has nothing to do with the way the Big Short or Fincher's movies are made whatsoever, but I mean, just in kind of general, what I like about the way these movies are so straightforward without trying to be flashy, um, why that works so well is that it's the way it's being so upfront, and it doesn't feel like, like when you talk about movies like Zero Dark Thirty potentially being like, you know, propaganda movies, 
movies that are this straightforward and just laying it out there and saying this is what it is there's definitely an integrity about how they don't they don't feel like they're trying to sell you something it's literally just them saying here's what it is and i get that a lot of people can probably be put off by that and it could be seen as like just you know con just constantly saying these are things that happen it can almost seem like you know watching some boring documentary or something and i and i can get that also um if there needs to be a particular like entertainment value for people to get hooked to it um which doesn't say that you know people that want entertainment value would take the subject matter any less seriously um but i i do think it works a lot in the case of the way they do it especially with some of the dialogue itself uh like the really disturbing scene when the guy is j justifying the torture to michael c hall uh, and just saying, like, oh, like with a smile on his face, practically saying, "Well, if we do this, you know, it, and that's just then we can do this thing." And, and it, this is the way he justifies it; just feels so. It's almost like skin crawling the way it is, and stuff like that, where you have an actor like Adam Driver that can bring this dialogue to life, no matter how matter of fact it is. And it sort of reminds me, going back to the Social Network, um, the way you can take like. Like, how there's there's definitely a way that, like, you know, Aaron Sorkin scripts need to be said, where Aaron Sorkin scripts have so much information in them, um, but the task of the actor is able to say this stuff, but also make it, you know, involving and engaging for somebody watching it. And this is the task that Driver has through the whole movie, um, with uh, Scott Z. Burns being the writer and director of this. Um, and, and yeah, you can kind of see this as, um, without him splitting it up the way you have, like, a Sorkin and Fincher team, um, you can tell by the way it's presented that this is sort of, this is a filmmaker that is predominantly a writer. Um, but still, like I said, the, the way, um, Driver has to make this dialogue engaging is the real challenge of this, and he does make that work, uh, throughout it. And there is, like, a really steady pace throughout, also. Um, and there's even moments when we get to, like, um, just even, just these little, hair, like, obviously the, there, the torture scenes are in the movie, um, which are, you know, really hard to watch to where you barely can at all, um, but then there's also scenes where just them talking about it, like, um, when Driver's talking to a colleague about, they're both talking about how just reading the stuff in the report is giving them dreams and nightmares about it and stuff like that like just really hits hard in the dialogue even if it's just even if it's just you know people talking about it and there's nothing particularly flashy or there's no like dooming music or anything like that um but it still works just with that alone and yeah and then there's and every now and then they also kind of get into the whole uh like the you know paranoia thrillers of the 70s where we have um, a character played by Tim Blake Nelson who witnesses the torture and all that stuff going on. And then there's the scene when he, much later, meets up with Adam Driver in the dark and tries to vaguely tell him what's going on, but also you you get this... He has this fear that he's being watched. And then if I remember correctly, we just never see him again. Um, and it's like stuff like that. I think they kind of conquered that feel here more so than something like Dark Waters, but... That's not to say the two were necessarily going for the same feel, but um, if you were looking for that sort of thing, um, the report really captures that. Um, and like I said, it's much more comparable to like All the President's Men or something like that. Um, even if it, even if movies like that are still much more flashy than the matter of fact nature that this movie has. But there are like, um, like I said, there is a steady pace, but every now and then there's like you know some shoddy editing and like a, a lot of it feels just like the movie is a series of montages and I can see that being off-putting and how it's like, as far as like any sort of artistic nature to the way it's played, um, you do get this sense like it, the movie itself and its style is relying a lot on the content itself, uh, to speak for it. When, um, you know, like I said, this isn't a, a, an approach you have to take, but there could have been like, I said some more artistic choices in exactly how you know the movie presents itself without losing, you know, any anything, any of that integrity or anything like that. Um, so people might be sort of looking for that, but if you're just looking for something really straightforward that doesn't feel like it's bullshitting you in any way, 
you're probably going to get that out of it. So e even the title um, is really clever because you look at it and it's like the report is such a bland title. But when you see the way it's presented on screen where it's the torture report and torture is redacted and that's the title. <laughs> and it's like that gives you this whole um, other thing. Also, this outlook on the movie itself. So, yeah. And then, you know, eventually we're going to get to the whole... Not only did a lot of stuff go unpunished, but it led to promotions for all the wrong people and all the people, you know, doing the wrongdoings themselves. And it's, yeah, you, you, it is, all these, all the, these, these whole three movies, um, kind of all at once are just, you know, really draining. And like I said, it just sort of can, can get, you know, more passionate viewers, like infuriated even. And I just, just by pure coincidence, I picked a bitch of a week uh, to see these movies because I also, not even thinking about it, I'm three episodes into that Chernobyl miniseries, and so I'm just, I'm just fucking tired now. Um, so, yeah, so that's, so yeah, that's pretty much all of those in a nutshell. Um, so just real quick, let's go on something totally different now. Uh, let's go into the Playmobil movie. Um, right off the top, I don't know what the hell Playmobil is, and I, I don't know that I had, I maybe heard its name in passing, but I never really knew exactly what it was prior to this movie. Um, and the, the only, basically the vibe that I get from watching the movie is they are, like, discount Lego toys and a discount Lego movie now. And it was really weird because I only knew going in that this was an animated movie. Uh, and it had, you know, like, Daniel Radcliffe, you know, playing a spy or whatever. Um, so I was, it was so incredibly jarring uh, <laughs> when the movie starts and there is a live-action Anya Taylor-Joy as, like, a teenage girl. And she's, like, she gets a musical number and she's got a little brother and there's a whole thing going on here. And it's like, okay, so I get, so I already went into this thinking this is going to be just a discount Lego movie, right? But no, all the way down to the live action, they're just totally shameless about it. And so, then it's like, it's so jovial about it. So like I said, she sings this generic ass pop song, uh, and they dance around and all that, and their brother and sister and all that. And then just when it's as joyful as it can possibly be, <laughs> it almost laughably <laughs> immediately changes its tone when they get a knock on the door from the cops. And we get the eternal line there's been an accident. And then suddenly there is a four-year time jump, and now Anya Taylor-Joy is so impacted by this tragedy that her hair has gone from blonde with, like, pink streaks to just dark. Uh, and, like, that's, that's the most we're going to get as far as character development goes. <laughs> um, and it's, or it, at least character, they, they, I mean, I guess you can say they try, but in this type of movie, you can imagine how much that's going to matter. Um... And so, eventually, they get to this place that's this setup. It's like this toy exhibit or something. And then it looks like a horror movie is about to start. We hear sinister-sounding laughter. And then this is where it's going to differ from the Lego movie. And it's them going into this toy world. And they become the toys themselves. And then the animated movie starts. She looks like herself, but for some reason, he's a Viking. I don't, they may have explained that, and I just didn't go a fuck. But <laughs> if, we're, if I'm going to be candid about how I felt about this movie as a whole. Um, after all these other movies, this is just fucking worthless. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, so of course, there's going to be a lot of running around aimlessly and mindless action and really uninspired lazy jokes and there is a, a guy that they that basically follows around with them for the rest of their movie as a little sidekick. A relentlessly annoying character played by Jim Gaffigan. Doing a total disservice to him, by the way. Um, and just overall, the animation is boring. Like, the backgrounds and the characters. Like, everything is just so uninspired and lazy looking and it's like that's not even necessarily actively comparing it to the lego movie if none of the lego movies existed you can even if we're being totally generous you can throw the lego ninjago movie into this um even if those movies did not exist at all 
this movie would still look so bland and boring in appearance um, that it's yeah and then there is this basically this back and forth of like the really you know dull and forgettable action and yeah um, it wasn't a spontaneous moment by any means that Donnie Taylor Joy has this generic pop song number at the beginning no uh, this thing's a uh, the this thing's a fucking musical <laughs> Why, do you ask? Because they didn't have any other ideas, apparently. Um, and it's and it, it, it seemed to end early, which means I think the credits are like 12 minutes long or something, <laughs> uh, when the movie's already short enough. So there's just nothing here. And everything that I said happens before the Dana Radcliffe character even comes in, who I imagine is probably the face of the movie. He's like this sort of Bond-like secret agent character or whatever um and yeah and then once again, there's just no even when he comes into it uh you would think oh well the face of the movie is here and daniel radcliffe's obviously going to be their selling point maybe there's going to finally be some liveliness to this thing there's not <laughs> it's exactly the way it was before just more car chases if you want to call it that and attempts at humor and whatever it doesn't matter um and there's there's a singing villain that they that keeps coming in and out of it like he's like i think they're trying to make him like fucking king candy from wreck it ralph or something but it's just it's just not working it just feels so all over the damn place the sort of the having all the sort of different worlds and characters i can see that being a good idea but it doesn't work at all and obviously has been done better in the past by better movies, more worthwhile movies, more movies that have some clear reason for existing that this is lacking. So that's really all there even is to say about it. I can't, having just seen it, I can't tell you what the fuck the story is apart from they need to find each other again so that they can get out of this world and go back into live action. I couldn't tell you what the fuck the villain was trying to do, or what the other characters were doing. There's like a, a fairy godmother or something that eventually shows up. I don't, I don't know. And I don't care. So, <laughs> and it might, and it might sound like I wasn't, you know, gonna give this a chance or anything like that. Um, but it's one of those movies that lets you know really, really early um, that there's nothing worthwhile here. Uh, and they clear they didn't seem to have a clear idea of what they wanted to do. They just had the idea of, well, the Lego movie happened, so we've got to do this thing with Playmobil. I stress again, whatever the fuck that is. So that's uh, what the movies this week were. Uh, <laughs> so next week, actually the next few weeks are just going to be, usually December's kind of dead until the second half, but... It's kind of a full December now. I think next week is Jumanji and Richard Jewell. And then the following week is going to be Star Wars, Cats, and Bombshell. Uh, I'm not quite sure where Uncut Gems is in there. I'm, if I had to guess, I'd say Uncut Gems will probably be like Christmas or something. Uh, and even then, with stuff like Little Women in 1917, uh, I'm not quite sure what's limited in December and then why in January or what's actually coming out in December. I don't know. Uh, so I guess we'll just just kind of go along as we go and another verse I will finally be doing another verses after this um, that should be out in the next day or so so uh, until all that stuff I think that's it for this